Okay, how are we doing, class? Uh, so this is tonight's homework. We're going to be looking at uh, Unit 7, Memory. Now, we talked about this a little bit in class, uh, but now we're going to get into the, the, the concepts that you need to know for this. Um, and to start off, uh, I just kind of want to let you know that we'll be going up to this point here. Okay, we will not be going past information processing. There's enough information for you there to kind of deal with tonight. After that, we'll get into forgetting memory construction and possible ways to improve your memory. Okay, so let's move on here. Now, you saw this guy. Whoop, let me go back here. One slide. All right, you saw this guy on the very first slide that I showed you. Uh, this guy's name's Steven, and what you're looking at now, as it says pretty clearly in the picture right here, is, is a drawing of Tokyo. In the first slide, that was not Tokyo, that was another city. But um, what you see here is this guy is has that endless memory that we saw in that video from 60 Minutes last class. Steven is able to look at a city from a helicopter, usually is how he gets up there. He's able to look at a city from a helicopter and then draw it exactly as he saw it from above. He just looks at it, comes back down to the ground, gets in front of a wall, piece of paper, and he can just draw the whole city. Now, just to give you a sense of how insane this is, everything from this building here to this building here to this little tower over here to little buildings here, all of that is accurate, guys. He has memorized, basically taken a photograph with his brain of all those buildings, all those roads, everything, and, and drawn exactly as it was. Even the amount of stories in that building right there are accurate. It's it's quite an amazing thing, uh, no less amazing than what we saw in that video the other day. So so we'll be looking at stuff like that a little more in depth, and we'll be moving on. We'll be talking about some other things here. So that was obviously an extreme of memory, no doubt about it. Now, when we're looking at memories, what are those? All right, so let's take a look here. Uh, I do my thing here where I mess up. Yes, I did. Oh, wow, look at that. Okay, here we go. Memory. So I didn't lose my place that bad. There we go. Storage and retrieval of information. And that's what we're going to be looking at, how we store information and how we retrieve it. That's going to be kind of one of the main focuses today. So... Uh, Information processing, sorry, there's no slide there, so we can just kind of move on. All right, and here are the three things that we'll focus on more. Encoding, and this is how we take information from our senses, and we translate it in a way that we can remember it for later retrieval. Now, we have to store that information once we encode it, okay, in the different storage levels, short-term memory, working memory, and then long-term memory. You've probably heard of those before. And then we have to retrieve it and get it back at the end. Uh, we're going to get back to this picture here. I don't have to look at that right now. So, sensory memory. What is sensory memory? Sensory memory is essentially anything we can sense. Remember the five senses, seeing, touching, hearing, smelling, tasting. All of those have a, a type of memory. Our brains, you know, can, can remember something for a very short amount of time when we sense something. And then there's short-term memory, and you've probably heard about this. Short-term memory essentially is uh, you hear somebody say something, and you might remember it for a short amount of time. Uh, usually they say that we have the ability to remember up to about seven digits, you know, plus or minus a couple. Um, so think of a phone number, seven digits and a phone number, you know, uh, eight two, three, five, six, seven, eight. If somebody told you that phone number, you'd probably be remember you'd probably be able to remember it uh, for a short amount of time. You know, and in that time you'd have to write it down or you'd have to repeat it to yourself over and over or put it down in your cell phone and then you could hopefully keep it for a longer term memory. And then there's the long term memory, which is your ability to keep memory that you can retrieve at a much later date. This may be uh, two days, a week, a month, a year. Uh, how, however long, maybe 10 years, 20 years, you know, there are certain things that we remember better than others. And that's long-term memory. It's forgotten about until we need it and we can take it back. So, modified version of the three-stage process and model of memory. Now, today, we don't necessarily go by sensory memory, short-term memory, and work in uh, long-term memory. We kind of have a couple different things here. And the key thing to look at here is working memory. Now, I'm going to click on this so you can see the definition. It's kind of a, a confusing concept. Let me just read it real quick. A newer understanding of short-term memory that focuses on consciousness, active processing of incoming auditory and visual spatial information, and of information retrieved from long-term memory. You have a lot of things going on here. Retrieval from long-term memory is one. And then you have uh, 
conscious, active processing of income and auditory and visual spatial information. Okay, so it, it goes beyond what short-term memory is. Short-term memory is, well, let me go back here. Short-term memory, again, is, is just kind of focused on the very basic principle of remembering a small amount of information for a short period of time. Work in memory goes far beyond that, and it, it's a little more complicated. You can think of work in term memory as incorporating short-term memory. Or I could say short-term memory is a part of working memory, and working memory is kind of the go-between between short-term memory and long-term memory. It, it, it's able to manipulate information that's incoming to our body and information that's coming from our long-term memory, and it can play around with that and decide what to do with it. You know, if we need it, then it'll bring it, uh, it'll retrieve it for us. If not, it'll kind of throw it aside. You know, so that's working memory. It's it's a little complicated, but if we have more questions about it in class, we can certainly work on that. Okay, so here we go. So I actually can kind of boom, boom, perfect. All right. So you can see here, and this kind of complicates the thing before I actually move on to explaining this slide right here. The fact that you see working slash short term memory is, is a little confusing because we tend to think that, <clears throat> excuse me, we tend to think that they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. Remember, working memory is much more complicated than short term memory. All right. So what happens? We have external events. This is certainly number one. Anything that happens, anything we sense, okay? And then, after that, right, that sensory input goes to our sensory memory where it's stored for a short amount of time. Now, if that information is important, then it might go on to working or short-term memory right here. And this is where we start to encode information. In sensory, in sensory memory, we don't really encode it yet. It's just kind of there very briefly. Um, again, I always bring the example of the air conditioner in my room. If that's going off, uh, you're sensing that, right? You're hearing that. Your brain hears that. But it's, it's so unimportant that you don't remember it whatsoever. You don't even think about it. It's just kind of in the unconscious. And so so that's kind of sensory memory in a sense. Um, okay, so we encode, I'm looking at this right here. So we encode some sensory memory that's novel. And by novel, I mean important. Okay, and then from there, if it's even more important, okay, so important that we want to retrieve it at a later time, we encode it further into long-term memory. And that's so we can retrieve it uh, at a much later date. And now let's, I believe, let's go, whoop, whoop, there we go. And so this is all unconscious. This isn't a bad thing to discuss too. Most of this happens without us even trying, which is the amazing thing. And we'll get into that, I believe. But let's look at this picture here. As you can see, let me move that if I can. No. Okay, I guess I'll have to, there we go. All right, so you look at this picture you, of all these faces. Do you see anything different? Uh, maybe if you look close enough. doesn't seem like anything's too, too important. Um, so you really possibly could forget it. Uh, however, if you keep looking on and maybe focus on it for a, a, a certain amount of time, you might start to notice individuals, right, and, and see their faces. How about this picture? Do you see anything there? Well, maybe you might start to see this guy right here, it seems like kind of he's a little different. He's standing up, he's, he's right in the middle of the picture. Um, you know, you can see his, the whites of his teeth, the glasses, the hat, kind of looks a little sketchy. Uh, and then you focus in on him more, and, and because his face may be so disturbing or so different from the others, <coughs> excuse me, that you might say, okay, that's important. I think we need to, I need to remember that. And so, so then you can put it into long-term memory if it's, if it's that important. All right, so automatic processing. Now, I told you before that we automatically do all this. If you remember parallel processing, I'll give you a second to think about that. Do you remember what that is? Well, we talked about it in uh, the unit on the brain, and it's kind of the idea that our brain can do multiple things at the same time. While one thing's happening, another thing's happening. And so a lot of this stuff, a lot of this... Uh, you know, uh, encoding of, of memory happens without us even having to try to remember it. And there's an important reason for that. Imagine that we had to make effort to remember every single thing that goes on in our life, or, or even just half of the things that go on in our life. Think of how hard that would be. Uh, we, Frankly speaking, your brain would probably be completely exhausted and wouldn't function too well. It'd probably die. Uh, because, for instance, like if I ask you, what'd you eat last night? Okay, so you thought about it, you probably remember, you know, most, hopefully you remember. Um, and if you did, you, you know, wh why did you remember, you know? Why, you never sat there and studied what you ate. You didn't have to sit there and, and keep reminding yourself of what you ate. You ate it, 
and you moved on and went on with your night and then you started the next day, but you remembered what you ate. And that's because it's automatic. Your brain just remembers certain things, you know. Uh, what did, kind of conversation did you have on the way to school today? Same kind of thing, right? You didn't actively try to remember that, but you did anyways. Okay, so, and that's the parallel. So these two parallel process and automatic process are similar. So this is also important and, and these are things we can discuss, right? Space, place, where things are, time, sequence of events, frequency, how often things happen, and well-learned information such as language. All those things happen automatically. You don't have to remember or make the effort to remember them. All right. And so then there's effort for, effortful processing. Let's see if I can say that right. Uh, when you study for a test, that is effortful. Um, and, and that's really the best example because usually – there's not many things other than school where you have to really, really try to remember at least this point in your life. And so that's effortful processing. We have to make the attempt to remember it. And, and there's sometimes a, a big process in, in trying to remember things. So let me just go to the definition here for the sake of it. Uh, encoding that requires attention and conscious effort. So then there's rehearsal, conscious repetition. When you rehearse something, you go over it and over it and over it. If you're trying to remember, for instance, in class, what negative reinforcement is for the last unit, you might have gone over that again and again and again and again, trying to get it. Okay, what is it? All right, it's when you want to increase behavior by taking away something that the person doesn't like. And you might just repeat that over and over to yourself. You might you read it over and over. And so that's rehearsal. And, and that does work. You know, if you, if you do make that effort by rehearsing something over and over, it most likely will be encoded into longer term memory. Same thing with a phone number. Somebody tells you a phone number, you say it over and over to yourself again and again and again. And if you say it enough, it's going to be hard not to, you know, not to remember it. So uh, then we have this good looking gentleman right here, uh, Ebbinghaus. Uh, he he kind of has this curve that I will go to right now. Um, okay, maybe not. I will be going to his curve very soon. But here you go. You can just see this is. Um, this is, you can pause this the video if you want and take a look at this. Okay, and then there's Evan House's curve. Uh, time in minutes, you can see over here, time in minutes taken to relearn list on day one. And when he talks about list, what he's talking about is a list of words. Okay, when he's talking about a list of words, kind of like what I did with you guys in class, uh, last, last class. And I gave you a list of words, try to remember them. Okay, so in day one, uh, Evan House had people remember words. How long did it take them to remember it? Well, let's see here. Uh, blah, 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 number of repetitions of list on day one. Okay, so 20 minutes right here. This is how long it took them in day one to remember, you know, the words. Now, how long did it take in day two? Okay, it might take less time. Okay, because if, let's say you, you learned 100% of the words day one, but then the next day, of course, you didn't encode all that those words, and so you forget some the next day. You have to go back to that list of words and go over it again. How long did it take you? Well, it didn't take you 20 minutes a second day. Maybe it took you, you know, right around here. And then on the third day, it only took you here to remember. And then on the fourth day here, and then fifth day here. You know, so the amount of time it takes to relearn something, you know, is less and less as time goes on, is you know, over the, over succeeding days or weeks or whatever like that. So to apply that to this class, if one day you learned uh, last unit's words, and the next day you forgot a lot of them, go back to them again. And if you go back to them again, it'll take less time to study those words. And then if you go back to it two days from then, it'll take you even less time to remember those words. And so that's a good study tactic, and it, it you know, it takes that time and effort, and that's why a lot of students probably don't do it, but nevertheless, it is proven to be successful. All right, so let me just read down here. I didn't read this beforehand. Number of repetitions of list on day on, uh, on day one. Okay, interesting. So, all right, moving on. Overlearning. That is possible, believe it or not, to overlearn. Um, and by overlearning, I'm thinking it's like kind of cramming, right? When you try to put too much information into your brain. If you do that, you're, you're just going to overlearn and you're not going to remember a lot of stuff. There's just too much information. It's kind of interfering with each other. So then there's the space and effect, which um, kind of refers to the fact that if you study over a long period of time, and again, this is rehearsal, and you go back to you know, uh, the material over a long period of time, then it'll be 
that are retained in your brain. So to give you an idea that one of the second units we talked about in this class was on research. Okay, that was in August. If you went back to it again, as hopefully you will for the, the, mid, the, the final exam for semester one, you'll go over it again, that's good. And then maybe you should go over it again in February and then go over it a little bit again in uh, March and then April, you know, do it once a month, go back to that material. If you do that over a long period of time, the chance of you retaining that information is much better. And therefore, hopefully you do much better on the AP exam. So um, that's spacing effect, mass practice, Distributed practice, that's kind of the best thing, right? Distributed practice, mass practice always isn't the best. Okay, so the test and effect, I honestly forget what that is, and it's not a big deal anyways. All right, so serial position effect. This is that game I played with you in class here. You always remember the beginning of a list of things and the end of it. Why do you remember the beginning? Well, this has to do with this primacy effect. You always remember the first uh, words on a list or numbers or whatever the case may be because you've gone over it so many times. You remember that list I gave you? Do you guys remember the first word? I think I do. I think it's this. Okay. All right. I think it was chicken. All right. So let's say it was chicken. Okay. And then the second word was, and I totally forget this, but I'm just going to make something up. Nose. All right. So what happens is I present to you the first word and I'm telling you to memorize this list. I present to you the first word chicken. And then I move on to the second word nose. And you're saying, okay, chicken, okay, chicken nose. And then chicken nose, uh, feet. I'm using body parts here. Uh, chicken nose feet, chicken nose feet. And you keep going over and over. So by the time you get to the end of the words, you have repeated this word to yourself many, 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 many times to the point where how can you not remember it? I mean, you repeat it to yourself maybe 10, 20 times. And so that's the primacy effect at the fact that you've seen it the longest and you've rehearsed it the most out of all the other words. Now, why do you remember, as we can see here, the end of a list? This goes to this right here, the recency effect. It's because it's most recent. It's more fresh in your brain. So therefore, it's easy to remember. Okay, all these words right here, in the middle are forgotten for the most part because there's interference and we'll get into this later actually but these words that you're trying to remember are interfering with these words and as a result you can't really remember that well what the words in the middle are and so that's that we'll get into interference pretty shortly all right and as you can see this blue line down here presents something interesting okay because because this first thing is immediate recall so i give you a list and you immediately recall it just like i did with you guys now when you guys get into class tomorrow, if I ask you to repeat that list, okay, this is what hopefully maybe would happen, at least when they did research on it. Whoop, when they did research on it, um, this, these were the results. Uh, you can see here the primacy effect really kind of took hold. People remembered after a short amount of time, uh, after the thing, maybe a day later or something like that, most of the words at the beginning. Why was that? Again, primacy effect because they repeated it so many times, but for some reason they, they remembered it. And then those words at the end, they didn't. And now why is that, right? Yes, it's still most recent, but because it's a day later, that the, it's only like 10, you know, uh, 10 seconds more recent than, you know, the first words. Because remember, the list was given to somebody quick. And so the recency effect fades over time and, and the primacy effect, because you've repeated them so many times to yourself and rehearsed them so many times that you remembered them a day later. And so maybe I'll play with that, play that with you tomorrow when you come in. All right, so levels of processing. You have different levels of processing. Take a three, take a look at these three and tell me, or think to yourself, what you think is the best type of encoding here. Okay, so visual has to do with reading, or, you know, well, reading or just seeing, right? Acoustic has to do with hearing. And then, whoops, sorry. Okay, let me erase that. So this is kind of weird. Dunk. And then I'm going to use another color here to go up here. There we go. All right, so those didn't go in order there. Sorry for that. So visual encoding is seeing, all right? This is when you just see something. You don't hear anything. You're just seeing something. How well are you going to remember that? Well, we'll find out shortly. Then there's acoustic. If you hear only hear something, how well you re, will you remember that? And then there's semantic, and this is when you're able to like read something and think about it, and 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 maybe even talk about it. You know, so which one of these is the best? It's 
definitely semantic for sure you know acoustic is good such as listening to music you know songs are easier to remember than your psychology textbook but um, semantic encoding is the best because you have sat there and made an effort to, to think about it and understand it and in that process you've done a better job at memorizing it too believe it or not so let's look at kind of the results of this okay so the percentage that I'm looking at the bottom here percentage of who recognized later recognized the word um, in semantic you can see close to 90 percent of people later recognize the word after they semantically encoded it meaning that they looked at a word maybe got the definition of it thought about how they could use that word in a sentence that they'd use in their daily life all of that that whole process allowed them to you know to remember it so 90 percent of the people remembered it and you can see with acoustic this goes down now acoustic less than 60 percent remembered the word and then visual um not many you're only talking a little over 10 percent so semantically understanding something is very important this is why teachers guys right this is why teachers tell you especially social studies and english teachers put things in your own words because if you put things in your own words that means that you have uh understood it at a deeper level you have semantically encoded that information and so you know in order for a teacher to know that you know what you learned you know, they have to, all they have to do is see if you put in your own words. If you didn't, then you probably didn't really understand it. Okay, so visual encoding. Um, here we talk about uh, imagery here, so visual, visual. So this is what we see with our eyes. Um, let's just kind of look at this real quick, this, this, this this uh, cartoon over here it's a mother and a daughter talking and the, the daughter says to her mother is this camping trip one of those special times you're always saying I want to share someday with my kids mom yes Hillary this is what family is all about sharing special times together okay I'll tell them I just hope I can do it with a straight face don't worry this this trip steeped in a few years will become one of those best memories of your life Ha ha ha, I can I know you guys are laughing at your computers right now. But what it's saying essentially is she's being sarcastic here and saying like, yeah, ma, okay, I'll I'll tell them about it, but I, I won't say it with a straight face, meaning that she's basically lying and she's being sarcastic. You know, but the mom says, oh, don't worry. You know, even though you don't like it now, in a few years' time, all you're going to do is remember the best parts of this trip, right? This is going to become one of the best memories. Why? Because what we do, is we engage in something called rosy retrospection. And by we, I'm saying humanity. After an event has occurred, you know, especially think of a vacation or think of something that you've done in your life that was completely boring and just terrible. Maybe it was a trip you took or a family vacation or sports trip or I don't know, something, okay? <clears throat> Rosy retrospection is when we look back on those events and we only re usually only remember the, the, the positive things. And so we look back at it and we don't think it was as bad as we really thought it was at the time we were, we were taking part in it. Um, I'm thinking of a vacation that I took uh, two summers ago with my wife and older daughter, Elsie, and where it took a five-week backpacking trip through Central America. And while Central America is beautiful and I love it, it was extremely difficult doing this with a little baby girl that was only nine months old. She's just learning to walk. We always had to worry about her falling back on her head, which she did, by the way, a couple times and freaked this out. Um, we always had to change her diaper. She was always crying at night, so we weren't getting good sleep. I mean, it was very, 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 very difficult. And so I, I always remember, I'm thinking about it now, and I'm saying to myself, you know, it wasn't that bad. We did some really cool things on that trip. We went to uh, the Corn Islands in Nicaragua. We went surfing in Nicaragua. We were hiking mountains and went bungee jumping in Costa Rica. Uh, we went scuba diving and swam with sharks in both Costa Rica and Panama. I mean, we did some awesome, awesome, awesome things. And so that's what I'm going to remember in, you know, far in the future. But I still do remember how difficult that trip was at the time. I remember at the time I was saying to myself, oh, my God, I just want to go home. I do not want to be here anymore because it was so difficult. And, uh, you know, those difficult times definitely outweighed the times we were having fun. Fun, But in the future, I'll be thinking about all those good things. Those are the things that are going to stand out in my memory. And so that's rosy retrospection. Rosary, rosy refers, refers to something good. And then there's mnemonics. I'm going to click on this. Mnemonics are memory aids, especially those techniques that use vivid imagery and organizational devices. I'm going to give you an example here if I can. Um, I always had my... Uh, uh, students of Latin American history back in Massachusetts try to remember uh, the countries of Latin America and the, always the hardest uh, area in Latin America to remember is Central America because it's a bunch of small countries that nobody really talks about too often <clears throat> and so I would have them memorize it and I came up with a mnemonic device to do this this is it ready I do my buddy Greg 
hates. Goodness, hates eating cold rice pudding. All right, totally weird. I'm sure there was probably a better one I could have come up with here. But um, this is the mnemonic device right here. This is, and if they remember this, I think remembering the countries of Latin of Central America would be pretty easy. I should actually probably do this in a different color. So, what do these things stand for? Mexico, Bel uh, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Costa Rica, and Panama. And so, this was just a device I used to help my students um, remember the countries of Central America. And it worked with a lot of them. Not everybody, because some people didn't try to remember this phrase. But if you tried, whoop, I didn't even spell buddy right. My, Buddy, there we go. Um, and so, if they remember this, then all they had to do is look at the first letter of each word and match it up with a country in, in Central America. Hopefully, they could do that. And so, and that was that. And, and I'd have them do it on a map too. So even if they knew the countries but didn't know exactly where they were in Central America, these countries go from north to south. So starting off with Mexico, right? That's the most northern. And then Belize is below that. Then Guatemala is below Belize. And then Honduras is is kind of so it's actually east of, but it's also kind of, uh, um, if you're just going down the lines of, uh, what is that, longitude, latitude, then you're going to see Honduras kind of being south. And then you have El Salvador, which is south of uh, Honduras, and then uh, Costa Rica is more south than El Salvador, and then Panama is the most south before connecting to Colombia. And so there we go. So that, that would help them. And again, it, it did work for, for a lot of kids. All right. So moving on, at chunking. What is chunking? Chunking, chunking, chunking. Okay. Organization, organizing items into familiar, manageable units often occurs automatically. This is what we do with words, guys, right? Ah, poop. Oh, man. Okay, so I'm going to have to go all the way back. All the way back. This is going to take a long time. All right, so we do this with words, right? We chunk words together. This is how we're able to remember a lot of words. Um, we do this with numbers sometimes, okay? And to give you an idea of that, here we go. All right, and to give you an idea of that, you think how Venezuelan numbers are chunked in, uh, it goes three, three, two, two. So you think of our area code, 424 or 281, depending if it's a cell phone or a landline. And then you have, let's say, uh, 829 is the first three numbers of the phone. And then you have 23.56 dot you know so you have it's chunked like that and so that chunking helps us remember numbers a little better um and so here just take a look at this do you think you guys could remember this if i were to give it to you all right if you're saying to yourself no you're probably correct all right but then if i gave you this would you remember this better absolutely why because first off they're recognizable letters that we can uh you know associate with our own languages so so that would really help so you can remember the bottom one better than the top. Okay, so then let's look at the next one. Could you remember that if I gave it to you? No, probably not. But how about this one right here? Nickel seven, any in stitch don't. Still difficult to remember because these words together do not make any sense, right? That phrase doesn't mean anything. Um, but it is easier to remember than this. Why? Because, well, it's unscrambled. This, or these are all the letters that make up the word nickel. Okay, but they're unscrambled so that it says the word nickel here. And so nickel's easier to remember than K L C I S N uh what is that? E, because that doesn't mean anything to us. But nickels does mean something to us. It's a metal, or in the United States, it's a coin. Um seven is a number, you know, things like that. So that's easier to remember. And then you have this. Could you remember these? Right? First thing again, nickel seven, any in stitch don't, seven a go, a score, time and nine wouldn't four years take. <laughs> Pretty difficult to remember, um, but nevertheless, they are words that we know. They're just not in the right order as to mean anything. But how about this? Could you remember these? Don't take any wooden nickels. Four score and seven years ago, and a stitch in time saves nine. Some some kind of well-known phrases here. This one being from whoop, from Abraham Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address. This is a famous phrase that you hear every once in a while. And then uh, I have never heard this ever in my life. So. I can't really give you any insight on that. But so chunking like that helps. That is one way we can remember. Um, here we go. We look at hierarchies, right? Okay. So at the very top here, you see encoding automatic and effortful. 
how all right so we have imagery to try to do this I'm gonna use a different color imagery here we have meaning and then organization okay how we organize things so how we see things okay this is that semantic encoding right an organization is kind of like that chunking in a sense right because you can see that here the chunking and then there's the hierarchies right what's more hierarchies refers to what's more important than others so this is all part of organizing and how we do this all right so Sperling's memory experiment. I actually forget the exact experiment that he did. So I'm just going to kind of move on to iconic and echoic memories. Right? Iconic refers to seeing, while echoic, think of an echo, refers to hearing. All right. And so iconic is what we see, right? Uh, memories that we see. Um, and usually, again, these are pretty short term. I'm pretty sure this is what it is. Um, a momentary, yeah. So momentary sensory memory of visual stimuli. A photograph or picture image memory lasting no more than a few tenths of a second. Okay, so this is something you see very briefly. If you take your head and move it from right to left, right, as you get to your left-hand side, what you saw on your right hand start when you started this process um, is probably already forgotten. That's because it doesn't last long, you know? Unless somebody was making a face at you and that's something you'd remember, um, you're probably gonna forget it, you know? If you just start on your right, look into your right hand side and look, see somebody just kind of staring off into space and then you move to the left and look at all your classmates or something like that. By the time you get fully to the left and you're looking to your left hand side, what you saw on your right hand side is probably forgotten. Um, and we'll get to that too. There's something called flashball memory, which becomes important. But uh, and then there's echoic memory. I can give a good example of this in class. If I see a student that's spacing out, and I say, "Hey, you, tell me what negative reinforcement is," you might sit there and be like, "Oh, oh, you know, it's this, this, this." After I had just said it. Now I picked on them because I didn't think they were paying attention. I thought I was going to get them, but they actually knew it. How did they know it? Well, because echoic memory is. Uh, as it says here, momentary sensory memory of auditory stimuli. Even if the person wasn't paying attention, they'll still be able to uh, remember it in a very short amount of time. Again, it says at the bottom here, four seconds. And so after four seconds, they're probably going to forget it. But within four seconds, they're probably going to remember it. Right. Now, the magic number seven, I talked about this in short-term memory. Again, uh, this... Actually, I forget the psychologist's name, but he was uh, pretty well known for, for coming out with this, saying that our short-term memory allows us to hold about seven digits, plus or minus two. And for the most part, that's true. I mean, again, everybody's different, so some people can remember more than others, and some people remember less than others. But take a look at this. If you want to pause the recording, you can take a look at some of these amazing stats on people that have insane memories. All right, but moving on here, we have this. Now, this is kind of a uh, difficult thing to explain. I'm going to try my best to do it. Long-term potentiation is what psycho cognitive psychologists believe is how memory and learning take place at a synaptic level. And by the synapse, what are we talking about? Do you remember? That's right. We're talking about in-between neurons where neurotransmitters pass, right? You remember at the end of one, um, at the end of one, neuron, you're going to have that little gap before the next neuron, and that's called the synaptic gap, right? And neurotransmitters pass there. That's those chemical messengers that are responsible for basically everything that goes on in our body in terms of information, right? So synaptic changes. Um, this is where learning and memory take place. Now, it's still not too, too well understood. There's a bunch of different theories on this, and so we still don't know the full answer yet, but yet we've, we've come pretty close. So this Scandinavian cognitive psychologist back in the 1960s came up with this term, long-term potentiation. Long-term potentiation basically refers to the fact, right? And so here you have neuron number one, right? And then you have neuron number two, all right? So I kind of, I don't know, maybe this isn't neuron number two. Let's say this is a synaptic gap or something like that, actually. Um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to go back and say that's uh, that's neuron number two there. So, okay, sorry about that. But anyway, so what you have basically is you have information, action potentials, shooting down one neuron and going into the other. And it passes through the synaptic gap right there. This is where neurotransmitters pass, right? And then from there, you know, you have the 
uh, incoming messages going through the next neuron and so on and so forth until it gets to our brain and then it goes back out to our sensory neurons. And so long-term potentiation refers to the fact that when one, when there's a lot of activity, activity going through two, going through a synaptic gap between two neurons, right? You get a lot of activity shooting in this direction here. Um, basically what this does is it strengthens, believe it or not, this synaptic gap, having all that information pass through that synapse. It, it strengthens it and it allows it in the future to have more action potentials and neurotransmitters shoot through it, okay? And so I can keep drawing these lines to signify that more and more, right? Uh, uh, synapses, uh, neurotransmitters can pass through. Why is this? Because again, what happens is that, the, that if there's a lot of action going between two neurons, then that strengthens that connection and allows for more activity in the future. And that more activity is basically translated into better memory and, and uh, more effective learning. And so what you see here, the difference between these two pictures that you're looking at is the fact that, see how big this neuron is, but then you see how much it's increased after uh, activity has taken place. That means it's been strengthened and it allows us to remember more and learn more. So pretty interesting. So now when it comes to memory boost in drugs, this is like the holy, oh man, it's like the holy grail of like, uh, of the pharmaceutical industry, if, if if drug companies could actually come up with a drug that boosted memory at, you know, by somehow influencing long, long-term potentiation at the synaptic level, they would make billions and billions and billions of dollars. Who wouldn't want to have a better memory? I think most people would. And so glutamate is one of the things that they've tried to look at. And again, they haven't found anything solid yet. A lot of it's experimental. And so the search continues. So uh, when it comes to memories, another thing that can help us remember more, and this was talked about in that 60 minutes thing, that video that we saw in Endless Memory is stress hormones, right? Do you remember the stress hormone that said was responsible for helping memories? be encoded for into long-term memory. I'm going to write it for you in case you didn't remember. If you said this, adrenaline, then you are right. Adrenaline is one of those um, stress hormones that uh, allows us to remember more. So again, if you're injected with a shot of adrenaline, okay, and your heart starts pumping, you start sweating a little bit, whatever's happening at that moment, whatever you see or hear is most likely to be remembered better than if you didn't have the adrenaline in your body. So adrenaline kind of it, it, that, that activity going on in our body allows those memories to be seared into our brain, right? Kind of like tattooed into our brain so that, you know, you can't forget them. And so that's why uh, wartime memories are, are so well remembered is because uh, your heart's pumping, people are shooting bullets at you, and you're seeing pretty gruesome things. And so as a result of all that adrenaline going through your body, you're going to remember a lot of those gruesome scenes. And so um, flashbulb memory refers to this. I remember flashbulb memory, and I can give a good example here. September 11th, 2001, when I was in college, and um, terrorists who took over uh, airplanes crashed into the Twin Towers in New York City. Um, flashbulb memory. I have three flash, flashbulb memories from that particular day. I'm going to show you the, what the definition is. One is um, when I woke up in the morning, my buddy called, and he told me to turn on the TV, and I, I, I just have this flashbulb memory sitting there watching the TV as one of the towers was burning. The second plane hadn't hit yet. And so I was sitting there saying to myself, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what's going on. And so then I went to class and the next flashbulb memory, I forget everything in between, but the next memory is me sitting down in my desk. I remember where I was sitting in the room and everything. And I remember a teacher coming in saying, all right, classes are canceled. Uh, the Twin Towers in New York City fell. Everybody go home, watch TV, do, do whatever, but no, no classes for the rest of the day. So we're like, wow, really? So that's that. I don't remember what happened again, really, until I was, I have this flashbulb memory of me sitting there on a couch of a buddy's dorm room, and we're just sitting there glued to the TV watching as things unfolded. It was actually quite, quite amazing. And so that's what that is. And do you have a flashbulb memory? Can you think of a moment in your life, a significant moment or event that um, is charged with emotion in, in which you have clear kind of visuals of you know, think of a car accident you've been in, winning a championship in a game, something like that. So maybe you do, maybe you don't. These are something we can talk about in class. All right, here we go. HM, a very interesting individual. Uh, I forget this game, I, this guy's name. I think it's Henry uh, Mortensen. No, that's not it. It's not Mortensen, but it doesn't matter. HM is kind of what he's known to in psychology. But this was a guy that had basically a lobotomy. If you don't remember what a lobotomy is from uh, Unit 3, it's when you basically get parts of your brain destroyed uh, 
purposely so as to stop something. Usually they perform lobotomies to stop people from getting epilepsies. Epilepsies are caused by uh, uncontrollable activity going on in the brain and it causes people to, to basically foam at the mouth and, and to fall on the floor and, and twitch. Um, and so if you lobotomize some parts of your brain, you can prevent neural activity from going absolutely insane to the point where you're going to go through an epileptic seizure. And so this is what HM did. He got this surgery and he had uh, many parts of his brain actually lobotomized, but in particular, he had parts of the hippocampus. Oh, I'm going to kind of overgo that hippocampus and the amygdala. Amyg, whoop, amygdala. Sorry, this is a mess. There we go. Amygdala. You guys might remember that. Amygdala is uh, in charge of the emotional parts of our brain and the hippocampus in charge of a large part of our memory. Uh, basically, what they realized after this was a couple things. Uh, HM basically had amnesia. Amnesia is when you basically completely forget something or you're unable to make new memories, right? So it's a loss of memory. Um, and so he had this afterwards, right? He, he definitely had loss of memory. And this is why he had short-term memory. This was no problem. He could remember things short term, but his long term memory was completely done. He had he could not make any more long term memory. So if he met somebody new after this surgery, he could remember them in the short term, right? Maybe in the next 10, 20 minutes. But then after that, if that person left and came back, he'd look at them again and say, Hi, who are you? My name's HM. And they'd be like, we just met. You don't remember me? And he'll be like, no, we, we met, really? And so that's, that, that was his problem. He couldn't make those long-term memories. However, he could remember his long-term memory from the past. Okay? So from before the surgery, he could remember things. He could remember his wife, his kids. He could remember the job he had. He could remember how to do things. He could remember... Uh, his family and, and, and different childhood memories, all that stuff. That wasn't an issue. It was anything that happened after the surgery he could no longer remember or encode into the long term. So what does that tell us? Well, this is what was so interesting about it was that it showed us that short-term memory and long-term memory are basically computed and in, in dealt with in different parts of your brain. And it also shows that um, the retrieval of long-term memory right? Because remember, he could retrieve old memories from before the surgery. So retrieval of long-term memory and the formation of new, whoop, that's an M, but there we go, of new memory is also done in a different part of the brain. And so this was just a lot of information to a lot of uh, cognitive psychologists during this time. Very, very important study that was done on this guy. He was actually studied until he died in 2008. Now his brain's sliced up into different pieces and held at the University of, uh, what was that, California in San Diego. So just a little FYI for you there. All right, so here we go. Implicit memory, explicit memory. Storing implicit and explicit memories. Implicit memory is uh, basically memory that is procedural. And I think that's going to use that word there. Yeah, procedural memory. Procedural memory um, is, is like riding a bike or speaking or remembering how to, uh, I don't know, you know, yeah, can you think of something to, to build something, you know? It, there's a procedure involved in it. And when it comes to that, that's a different type of memory than explicit memory, which is basically memory of facts and experiences that you consciously have to try to remember. And so those are two different types of memory and they're done in two different parts of the brain. Because going back to HM, HM could and did have implicit memory, but he didn't have explicit memory. Okay, so those are two two different things and uh, done in two different parts of the brain. Um, and so, of course, you see here the hippocampus, right? I don't really have to stick on this, right? Neural center that is located in the limbic system helps process and, uh, explicit memories for storage. Um, so there you go. Okay. All right. And then the cerebellum also, I think that the cerebellum deals with procedural memory. So, so the hippocampus is explicit memories, okay, which are things that you have to consciously try to remember. And the cerebellum deals more with procedural memory. So you, you can see this here, right? Uh, without conscious recall processed by the cerebellum, right? This involves uh, motor skills, 
classical conditioning, you know, like taste aversion and stuff like that. And then you have over here explicit, right? This is the stuff you have to try to remember, right? This is done in the hippocampus, right? Personal experiences, facts, general knowledge, all that. Okay, now think back to your first memory as a human being. I'm going to ask you guys this tomorrow, what it is. Mine is walking down the street with my two sisters. My older sister is four years older than me, and my younger sister is four years younger than me. My younger sister was, I don't know, maybe born in, within a year. My older sister was around eight or nine, and I was about four. And we're walking down the street. My older sister is pushing my little sister in a carriage, and our little cat's walking with us that we had just bought. And I know exactly where we were. I remember whose house we're in front of, the type of day it was, and I just have this flashbulb memory of that one moment. And that's it. I don't remember what we did before or after that moment, but I, that's my first memory as a human being. And so um, why four years old? Why don't I remember anything from two years old or three years old? And let's go to the video that we saw of people with endless memory. A lot of the people's memories didn't start until 11 years old or five years old. So why not when we were younger? Why does nobody remember you know, being born or uh, our first step or anything like that. Two reasons that you've probably already read as of kind of posing those questions to you. First one is that we usually are allowed, we usually keep memories by using words, right? We use language to, to, to organize our thoughts and our memories. For instance, I remember being with my sisters. One was older, one was younger. We were in front of uh, Miss McRae's house on Pleasant Street. You know, you see how I just went through that memory using words. And so that helps us. Imagine you had no words to remember something by. You'd have flashbulb memory for sure, but it would be, it, it, having the words allows you to, to semantically encode that information so much better. And so having words is very, very important. And children below the age of four don't really have strong language skills quite yet. Okay, So that's the first reason. The second reason is because our hippocampus is one of the last parts of our brain to develop. And as a result, right, it's harder to remember things. And take a guess, guys, when that part of our brain develops. If you're saying or thinking four years old, you are absolutely correct. I didn't mean to write four yo, four years old. Okay, here we go. So retrieval, getting information out, recall, recognition, and relearning. So I'm just going to kind of go through these words real quick with you. Recall is a measure of memory in which the person must retrieve information learning earlier as in a fill-in-the-blank question. This is a good way to think about it, right? A fill-in-the-blank question. All right, when you get that on a test, that's kind of your, you're being asked to recall information. All right. Recognition is the multiple choice question on a test. Okay. You must identify. You only need to identify items previously learned. And so in multiple choice, in this class, you get five choices. And so you have to identify which one is correct. So that's recognition or recognizing a face in a crowd of somebody that you know, you know, things like that. Um, and then there's relearning. Okay, a measure of memory that assesses the amount of time saved when learning material for a second time. We talked about this with the Ebenhaus curve, so you already have that. I don't need to talk about that at length. All right, and then retrieval cues. How do we retrieve things? All right, we can have mnemonic devices, as I talked about earlier, right? I, I gave you my buddy Greg hates eating Nana's cold rice pudding about Central American countries. You know, that's a mnemonic device. Um, retrieval cues. Right, in retrieval cues, I should actually take the mnemonic device out of here since we already talked about it. Right, these kind of are related here. When you prime somebody, you're basically trying to give them a hint as to what they need to remember. So it's the activation, often unconsciously, of particular associations in memory. A lot of our memories are associations. It might be associated with a place, it might be associated with a person, something like that. Um, and so if you prime somebody, they'll remember it better. And so Let's get into this. Now, let's read what this cartoon says. Let me refresh your memory. It was the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring until you landed a sled drawn by a reindeer on the plaintiff's home, causing extensive damage to the roof and chimney. Ha, 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 ha. All right. I don't like that cartoon. All right, so here we go. Priming. All right. You see or hear the word rabbit. Okay. Then you think to yourself, hmm, rabbit, white rabbit. And then... That will prime you to think of another word for rabbit, which is hair. I don't know why they put this here, right? But you start thinking of hair, which is another word for a rabbit. And so, so by seeing the word rabbit and thinking of a white rabbit, primes you to think of the word hair. And you can do this, again, when I give you a hint on a test, which I don't do too often, sorry about that. Um, that might help you, you know, I'm going to prime you to think of something. If I want you to remember uh, 
you know, I want you to answer the answer to a question is, let's say Venezuela. I might prime you by saying, hint, oil. You know, even though oil doesn't have to do with the question I asked you, you know, you might say, oh, oil, Venezuela, South America, yeah. And so I primed you. And so context effects also are important when it comes to how well we remember something. All right, the context of something, meaning like where are we when something occurs? I'm not going to get into deja vu yet. We all kind of have an idea what that is. All right, so an experiment was done where people underwater, you can see the scuba diver here, right? Boop, boop, boop. Right, the scuba diver was asked to remember things that he saw underwater. Remember, you can't hear underwater, so he was shown pictures, or she was shown pictures to, that they had to remember when they got on land. And so, how well did that person remember the things that they needed to remember while in the water when they got back on land? Uh, you know, again, this only goes up to 40% here, so it wasn't much. All right, so let's look. There we go, a little over 20%. Now, how about if you reverse that and you showed people things on land, pictures and words, whatever, and asked them to identify them underwater? How well would somebody do that? What, what percentage of words would they be able to recall? Even less, believe it or not. Wow, that's kind of interesting. So it's not good to try to remember things underwater. My guess is because um, you're underwater and you're worrying about other things other than a list of words. But anyways, so how about this, though? Okay, I'm going to move this up here. How about if you show somebody a list of, you know, words underwater, and then you go down a little later back into water and ask them to remember the same list of words. What percent would they remember? Boom, 30%. So a significant increase from when you went from water to land. When you go water to water, you remember better. Now, how about land to land? Look at that. If I teach you something on land, like a list of words, and then I come back to you on land and I ask you those same words, you might remember up to 40% of those. And so that's pretty significant from, from that, I would say anyways. And so context matters. When you're in the same context as when you learn something, then you're probably going to remember it better. Like in this class, you learned a, what a lot of concepts are in this class. And so what happens when you leave this class. Are you going to remember that material as well when you're talking to your family or friends about something interesting you learned? Probably not. But when you come back into the class, you might remember it better, actually. You know? All right. So that's when they say also, if you lose your keys, somebody might say to you, retrace your steps. Because if you're in the context where you lost the keys, you might think to yourself, oh my God, this is what I did with my keys. Because there'll be things in the room or something like that that remind you of what you did. So, all right. Boop. Mood congruent memory. This refers to the fact that um, you remember things better when you're in the same mood as when you when something happened. So the tendency to recall experiences that are consistent with one's current uh, good or bad mood. Okay, so if I'm in a bad mood and something happens, I'll easy, more easily remember that event than uh, the next time I'm in a bad mood. It's kind of interesting. And the same thing goes with any emotion for the most part. All right, and here we go. Forgetting. This is where I'm going to stop, guys. Um, we are finished with this. We do not have to talk about forgetting. This will be uh, the next homework assignment. Thank you. Remember, hopefully you took notes, good notes on this uh, presentation, and you'll have a quiz when you get into class. See you later, guys. Bye.